Glad to be here this morning. Excited to be at church. And I, I'm going to let, I, I could talk a lot about youth conference. I've been here the last couple days with the kids, and, and uh, I'm just going to tell you, I, as your pastor, and this may sound really preachy and pastorly, but young people, if you were here, let me tell you, more than any ball game, more than any accolade or award you ever win on this planet. The greatest honor as your pastor is to watch you worship. Because in that moment of worship, then the rest of the stuff, according to Matthew, works itself out. So long as he's first. So long as he's first. And so uh, as much as those other things are great, and I'm super proud of those things, when I watch you lose yourself in worship, and you sing things like, if you want my heart, I won't second guess. My prayer is, as your pastor, and this goes not only to the young people, but everybody in the room, my prayer is, is that you won't second guess. Because the enemy does his best and attempts your entire life long to cause you to second guess that reality that Jesus Christ wants your heart. He wants who you are. Y'all excited to be at church? Yeah. Y'all excited to talk about the elephant in the room? Yeah. <laughs> you don't know which elephant's coming. <laughs> It got real quiet. I got to find my table. Hold on here real quick. They keep moving it on me and putting it in different places. So here it is. So elephant in the room, for those of you that don't know, if you're a guest with us today, maybe you swung by, maybe you're vacationing over here enjoying the, the God's country that is the Twin Lakes area. I believe God resides here. And not just in our church, we had a pastor that was here this week at the youth conference, Pastor Christian from Oklahoma, and he said, um, all our lakes are brown and red. And I said, our lakes are clear, our rivers are clear. And he said, this doesn't seem real. And, uh, and so we are blessed to live where we are. So if you're guests this weekend hanging out with us, then just consider this your church home away from home. And uh, I pray that we do something in your spirit today that fires you up and you get to go home and kick the hinges off the back door. Because Jesus Christ is alive and he is doing some amazing things, okay? He's doing some amazing things. We get to baptize, so if you're here today, just to let you know kind of how the service is going to flow, I'm going to preach to you. We're going to close out. And then we got some baptisms immediately following service, okay? And I say immediately following. Aaron's going to come up here and talk, and I'm going to slip out. We're going to baptize them. But some of these are students from the youth conference, so we get to celebrate that with them today. And so anytime we can celebrate life change, that's a good day for us as believers. So Elephant in the Room started off by being a series we did several years back. I think we're about six years in. You guys seen our pink elephant out in the uh, foyer there? That pink elephant, we ordered that dude from China. He got here a long time ago, pre-COVID, so don't blame me. <laughs> Sorry, political joke, couldn't help it. Um, but he's been all over the country. We've been able to send that guy to Detroit. He's been in Nashville. I think he went to Florida for a season. Um, where other people have wanted to use this series. And the premise is this, what is the church not talking about? What are some things that are happening in the world that the church just isn't talking about? And we put it out on social media and go, hey, tell us what the elephant in the room is. What is it that people aren't talking about? We got some great stuff this week. Not as many things this week, um, but we did get some questions that I want to talk through. And let me just tell you, I want to warn you straight up. I know if you came and you're just like, oh, Pastor Vince is going to be really funny today. Today is heavy. It's not an easy sermon to preach. Uh, it's not an easy sermon to receive. I'm going to tell you, as the one who was on the receiving end of it firsthand, it's not easy to receive. And so I want to walk through this, this idea of what the elephant in the room today we're going to talk about. There's a couple questions that came in. One of the great questions that came in was, what is the cost of discipleship? That's a big question. One of the questions that came in is, anxiety a sin? So if I were to ask, how many of you have anxiety from time to time? Be honest. 
And then yet the Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things by prayer and supplication, giving thanks unto the Lord. So wait, if the Bible says not to be anxious, but yet I deal with anxiety, am I sinning? So there's some great questions that came in. I'm going to try, I'm going to do my best to hop on these topics. But one of the questions that came in that really kind of intrigued me was a question that came in and it was like this. What do you do to people? Let me, let me try to find the question here so I, don't, I get it right. What do you do with people that use the Jesus loves everyone to excuse the actions of people? Anybody seen any of that happening? If you haven't, just jump on social media for about 2.3 seconds and you'll see it happen. We live in a world that really enjoys the idea of justifying some of the things that we do. And so I want to dive into some scripture first and I want to give you, I'm going to be all over the place. This isn't typically how I preach. I'm usually more expositional where I just walk through a passage of scripture today. It's a little topical because of the topics that came in. And so I want to give you some foundational scriptures, and I want you all to help me on these. And so first scripture is found in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and when, church? Forever. All right, that's good news, right? I'll tell you why it's good news in just a second. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says this, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, I want you to catch the meaning of this passage, because he's speaking to the children of Israel. He says, listen to me, children of Israel, I do not change. And because I do not change, that's what therefore means. And because I do not change, you are not consumed. This is a great verse for you if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Christ. The fact that God doesn't change, that he's not wavering, he's not flinching, he's not sitting there going, hmm, maybe, no, he's not doing that gives me hope because it means that because he is so consistent, I can rely on him. And because I can rely on him, the world will not consume me. That's a good promise for you and I. This is the third verse I want to give you, and you're going to catch the theme. James chapter 1 says, Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. No shadow, because he doesn't move. He doesn't change. You say, okay, where are we going with this? Obviously, it's a, the idea that God's the same. He doesn't change. If God is the same, then God's principles are the same. If God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then what was wrong in your Bible then is still wrong in your Bible now. True statement? Here we go. Y'all ready? So what do we do in a world that says, we're just supposed to love them? You're supposed to love them. I don't know if you've ever seen people use, or, or they'll take snippets of the Bible and kind of tell their own story with it or use it how they would like to use it. And let me just tell you that, that both ends of the spectrum are wrong. There are people out there that just say God is love and we expect him to kind of walk around petting a little tiny miniature unicorn, just making everybody happy and just shooting rainbows out of his ears. And he's awesome. We love that God. He's great. He looks like Gandalf. Right? Big old beard, man. He's amazing. But then there are others that figure up every time God shows up, he needs to show, to show up with lightning bolts striking people down for everything that they do. And just that's who God is. And you're both wrong. You're both wrong. And so as we kind of dig into this question, this idea of how does the church respond, we've got to understand some of the things that we're responding to. We live in a world that doesn't like the terminology sin. We, we definitely don't like the terminology when it's used to define us. If I say I'm a sinner... In the church context, if you've been in church for a long time, we've softened it enough to where we put it in songs. I'm a sinner saved by grace. We put it on coffee cups. Just an old sinner saved by grace. And it's great that we've recognized our role, but I think we've lessened what sin truly is. What I mean by that is that we'll excuse it. And we treat it when we mess up just like that. Well, it's just a mistake. It was an accident. I didn't mean to. And then tomorrow when we didn't mean to, we say the same thing. And the day after that when we didn't mean to, we say the same thing. I didn't, it was an accident. 
This is, I, I just kind of stepped into it, you know, I didn't mean to do it. That wasn't my intention going in. And so we have to address it, and I think we have to really address it in a real way as we start looking through this idea of sin and Scripture and what it looks like. Now, I'm going to ask somebody, Walt, can you come up here for a second? I know. Front row, dude. You're bad. Okay. <laughs> now all the people in the back row are saying, they're like, I knew that was going to happen. So, now I want you to stop right there. Walt, can I take your picture? I'm not going to post it anywhere, I promise. Do you want me to send it to somebody? No. So, so I'm going to take a picture of you. All right? You got a, got a picture. So now, Walt, let me just clarify something for people. Walt, you and I have known each other. We both had hair. We both had hair, yeah. <laughs> so there you go. There, there's, there's the history right there. But we, I'm, I'm 45. I was probably 12 when you guys first came to the church there. Maybe. And so it's a long time. That's math, and I wasn't going to do that. So I just so thirty plus thirty years that we've known each other, correct? Now I want you to ask. Now I, I know some of Walt's story. Would you say that I know some of your story? Yep. But I want to ask you: Does this snapshot that I have of you, by this snapshot, would I be able to explain your entire life story to everyone in the room? Would I even come close? Probably not, right? Even though I've known you for that long, I haven't really known you for that long. There were seasons we just didn't even see each other, right? All right, so give it up for Walt. Thank you, Walt, for helping me out. Here's the struggle that we have in a world that likes to throw out Jesus and likes to throw out God. They only have a snapshot of who he is. And because they have a snapshot of who he is, they read a verse that said God is love, then they stack that verse into any current situation that they see you're dealing with. If somebody calls someone out for sin, oh, God is love, we need to just address it that way. The problem is they're trying to describe a God from a snapshot that they haven't taken the time to fully understand. Okay? Before you clap, ask yourself if you fully understand. Because there may have been times you've done the same thing. I told you this wasn't, this was, the, I, I, I was writing this out as God was laying it on my heart. And as I began to write it out, I was like, ooh, ooh that's, that's a good one, God. When I say that, there's going to be some people that curl their toes up. They don't want to hear that stuff. And then the next time my pen came off the paper, I was like, ugh, oh, he's talking to me. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I had to just stop for a second. Because you see it constantly. You see people take this snapshot of God that you see it no matter. And, and let's just be honest and talk about the elephant in the room. We live in such a politically charged culture right now that if you say one thing that sounds like it's supposed to be on this side of the aisle, then it doesn't really matter if you investigate it on that side of the aisle. We're just going to blow you up because you said just a snapshot of what you believed on this side. And it doesn't matter which side. We're just going to blow each other up. That's kind of what we do. Youth conference was so good. Tell people it felt a little bit like heaven because it didn't matter what name was on the door, it mattered what name was on your heart when you walked through the door. And we worshiped together. Aaron's going to tell you this in a second. I think we had nine different churches represented We came to youth conference. And you know what? None of us cared. We just said, your love's too good to leave us here. And we said it together, raised voices. In our culture, somebody, my, my daughter actually is the one that brought this question to me, and she said, Dad, I'm struggling as a, as a young adult. I'm looking at our culture, and, and I keep seeing people with things that come up that are blatantly sin, that are a blatant disregard for the Word of God. And so I said, okay, lay it on me. What kind of examples you got? She said, well, I have a lot of friends that, that are supportive of the LGBTQ plus community. And, and, um, and so I, I, I just don't, I want to be able to talk to them. I want to be able to love them. I want to be able to show them Christ. And I want to be able to do that in a biblical way. But I'm struggling because about the moment they bring something up that I'd like to discuss with them, somebody kills the discussion by dropping the, well, Jesus just loves them all anyway. And where do you go from there? Christians are just throwing this out because we don't want to confront the issue. Let me walk you through because back in the day there was a terminology and we all got bracelets that said it. You remember the what would Jesus do? WWJD. Got a t-shirt. Some of you may still have the tattoo. Okay. 
because it's on your foot and you're spiritual and you walk where he, wa no, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I feel bad because somebody just got an idea. They're like, that's a great idea. I think I'm going to, are they open on Sunday? <laughs> don't, don't, if you go, please don't say, Pastor Vance told me to come get a tattoo on my foot. We sometimes will throw out the what would Jesus do? And like I said about the snapshot, we don't really know what Jesus would do. You know what Jesus did when he was confronted with sin? He confronted sin. Now, before you jump in and like, Woo! That's right, he confronted sin. Make sure you don't do it like a redneck. Because that end of the spectrum is wrong too. I see people all the time doing the, well, we're just supposed to love them all. And I see the opposite end of the spectrum so and we'll kill them all and let God sort them out. You both need to repent. Because here's what Jesus did when sin confronted him or when he confronted sin. And let me just tell you, he was bold about it. He was bold about it. If you don't believe he was bold, ask the woman at the well. You imagine what that conversation was like? Some of you may not know that story, but here's Jesus. He goes in midday, he's sitting at the well, and he meets this woman there who goes at this time because of the life she lived. But Jesus, he's Jesus, and she doesn't know Jesus, but he knows her. And so he just walks up to the lady out of nowhere and is like, hey, how you doing? I'm good. Oh, okay. Um, are you really good? Because I know you've been married this many times, and the dude you're living with now you're just shacking up with. Like, that's the conversation. Five seconds in. How many of you, like, let's just put this in our world. Because this afternoon, if you're cruising through Walmart and you're passing the cleaning section, you get right over by the electronics and God lays it on your heart and says, hey, there's sin in their life, call it out. And you just walk up to that person and go, hey, you're shacking up and it's sinful. How many of you are ready for that or you're just going to pray for forgiveness after you disobey? <laughs> Let's be straight, okay? I, I, we, there's the reason the name on the sign is the name on the sign. Listen, if we don't begin to understand the reality that sin is the thing that is separating our world from God, then we will continue to be separated from God. Well, but Pastor Vince, I'm saved. I'm so excited that you made that decision. But are you following? See, we're going to get into the cost of discipleship in just a second. I'm going to give you some scripture right here because in regards to sin, again, we lessen it. We take it down a notch. It's not sin. Here's, what, here's how God describes sin in his terminology, just so you're clear on what he really thinks about it. In Isaiah chapter 1, it says it's like putrefying sores. Psalms 38, a heavy burden. Titus calls it a defiling filth. A binding debt is what it says in Matthew, which is interesting because Matthew was a tax collector, and I can see that making a lot of sense to him. Darkness, according to 1 John, and a scarlet stain in Isaiah. There's another scripture that says that the sin in your life is as a stench. It's a stink that rises up into heaven into my nose. That's how I see sin in your life. Realize that when you have sin in your life, God smells you. He can't see you. We don't talk about that a lot in scripture because the coffee cups all say, well, God's looking down on me. Not if you're living with rampant sin in your life. He's smelling you. Been seasons he's smelled me. And it hadn't been good. But what we do with that, instead of really defining it as a putrefying sore, a boiling, pus-filled blister, or defining it as filth or darkness or a scarlet sc stain, this, this, is an, I just, it was an accident. I just messed up. I really struggle with that. My personality really struggles with really kind of staying the course on these things. And folks, we've got to stop and we've just got to call it what it is. And the Bible says it's sin. And the reason we have to call it sin is because when you read the Bible, it doesn't say what you can do with accidents or mistakes. But it will tell you what you can do with sin. It also tells you what sin can do to you. 
Hebrews chapter 10 is one of the most powerful chapters in all of Scripture because the first 24 verses really walk through like what it is to be a believer, what it's like to walk hand in hand in the family of God, what it's like to know that Jesus Christ has come and he has saved you and he has redeemed you and he has set you on high and it has been good that Jesus Christ has come and everybody's happy about it. Why? Because Jesus said yes and I said yes and we're a family. Woo! It's good stuff. And then chapter verse 25 and 26 comes in. And some of you will have never heard this passage before because it just doesn't get talked about a lot in church. And I want to read it for you and I want you to hear the weight that sin truly has in our lives. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26. I call this the every preacher's favorite attendance verse. So if you miss church, your preacher's going to throw this one out at you. For if we go on, excuse me, verse 25 says, and forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as some people do, but join together encouraging one another more as the day of the Lord draws nigh. So that's one that preachers love. But then verse 26 gets very heavy. After talking about being one with Christ, he says, for if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Verse 27, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. They haven't put that one on a coffee cup yet, have they? No one's got that one hanging on a calendar in the room. Understand, it's pretty heavy. I mean, I'd much rather read that, you know, God is my refuge and my help in time of trouble, that, that his strength is made perfect in my weakness. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, but that sacrifice that was given in that only begotten son comes to a place where we go, if we sin deliberately, if after the knowledge we know Christ and we just treat it like it's nothing. And he goes on, he gives them a history lesson because he's speaking to the Hebrews. He's speaking to the Jewish people here. He says, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses, well, they die without mercy, just on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Like if, if you broke the law of the Old Testament, then just two or three witnesses would would be able to condemn you. And that's, that's an extreme case, I know. And, and here's what I, I get tickled at is people that, that love Jesus but don't love his word. A lot of times what you hear in the current culture is, well, we're a New Testament church. We're a New Testament church. It's not as rigid as the Old Testament. It's not as structured as the Old Testament. Let me tell you and let me give you a definition of what happens in the New Testament. Anything that was asked of you in the Old Testament, the New Testament is an amplifier of it. God didn't give you less of a standard when he offered his son for your life. That didn't drop. It didn't become easier to follow Christ. In fact, he gives them the history lesson by saying, hey, back in the day, if you would have broke the law of Moses, one or two people, two or three people could have condemned you to death. Listen to what verse 29 says. How much more, how much worse a punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who tramples underfoot the Son of God. Say, so what does that mean? Jesus gave us everything on the cross. How many would say amen to that? Amen. Yeah, he gave us everything on the cross. And in giving us everything on the cross, and I want you to hear my wording, in giving us everything on the cross, we received a gift. We're going to hit that verse in just a second. Now let's talk about this from a parent's perspective. How many of you have ever given your kid a gift? And then the next day, find it beat to pieces in the yard. Any takers on that one? Yes. God bless kids. We get frustrated. You just got that. Why are you treating it like that? Clean it up, put it up. Why'd you leave it out in the yard? That's my favorite one, because I have boys, and everything ends up in the yard. Everything. Spoons. Kitchen spoons. In the yard. Help me, Jesus, as I walk through this season of my life. 
that ends up, I mean, why'd you leave it in the yard? That's something I got you. And the thing is, see, me as the giver, I valued the gift, maybe not because of what the gift was, but because it came from me. I sacrificed in order to give it. And then the frustrating part is that the receiver treats it as if it's nothing. I'll just let that sit for a second. Because there is a giver of the gift who gave with great value. And although we've received it, I don't know that we treat the gift of salvation with the value it deserves in our life. Sometimes it seems as if we just leave it in the yard. We'll pick it up on Sundays when we go out there, but... Like through the week, I'm not, it's rained on. I'm not really building it up. I'm not really taking care of it. I'm not really leaning into that gift because it's good for when I need it. But and what you didn't understand was that wasn't the intention of the gift. The intention of the gift was for you all the time. It was for you in every moment. And so we move very quickly from this idea of sin and that it has to be addressed in your life to the idea of the cost of discipleship. And you can read in the scripture, it says it pretty clearly in Ephesians chapter 2, and, and I put this phrase in there, you can meet Jesus and it won't cost you anything at all. You can meet him and it won't cost you anything. Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Don't miss that part. By grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. God did not look down from heaven and go, oh, you deserve salvation and you deserve salvation and you deserve me putting Jesus on the cross on your behalf. That's what you deserve. No, see, that would have been a payment. That would have been a wage for work done. No, salvation is a gift to you. It's a gift to me. Uh, there's no way. I know it's a gift because he saved me. Me and my hypocritical self show up on church on Sunday, do what I want the rest of the week. Because my dad was the preacher and I figured coattail salvation was as good as any. I was just going to ride it out. Because my dad knew Jesus really well, I must be close enough to at least get in the gate. And that's a lie that the devil will spin in your heart. Young people, old people, if you're here because grandpa was a, a preacher, but you have not made things right with Jesus Christ, you have yet to receive the gift. You're just playing around the edges of the party. And there's a gift there for you. It's free. But, but following, following gets a little heavier in Scripture we see Jesus offer this to everybody, but the following becomes a little heavier. It becomes a little more. There's some weight to it when we say we're a follower of Christ. No, no, Vince, I follow Jesus. No, I need to know. You're going to know if you're a follower of Jesus. Are you carrying weight? You carrying any of the responsibility of heaven? No, Vince, that's God's job. Not according to the word. I'm about to open it up and you're going to read it. And you're going to see it. Your salvation didn't cost you everything. Your discipleship, your following Jesus will cost you everything. It'll cost you everything and it won't make sense to the world around you and say, Vince, I don't know if I'm ready to, to give everything. Don't try to have that discussion with Jesus. He's not going to understand it. Because he was absolutely willing to give everything. Even while you and I were yet sinners, he gave everything. This is what it says in the book of Matthew. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, if anyone's going to come after me, let him deny himself, take up the cross, and follow. So eventually you're saying, I, I, I don't get to do anything I want to do. What I'm saying is, Everything that you want to do runs through the filter of Jesus first when you follow. Everything that you want to do runs through the filter of Jesus first when you follow. When you're a fan, when you're a fan of Jesus, then you do what you want and hope he blesses it. When you're a follower of Jesus, you don't do anything you want until you run it through the filter of Jesus. You say, Jesus, is, what do you think? Is this okay? 
Do you have another direction? Your will, not mine. Your will, not mine. John the Baptist said it when he was preaching, when he was talking. He said, there was one coming, and when he comes, I must decrease and he must increase. This is how this works. It's got to be more Jesus, less me. More Jesus, less me. Why? Vince, why has it got to be that way? Because no one's going to get to heaven seeing you. They're only going to get to heaven seeing Jesus through you. Man, as good as we are on my best day, and there are some days I think I got it. I think there are moments where I'm like, <laughs> parent of the year, right here. And then there are moments my kids are building zip lines and 40-foot trees tied to lawn chairs, pulling behind truck bumpers. I'm like, I don't, maybe God, I, thank you for your provision <laughs> and your protection and your blessing. There are moments I preach a sermon and I think, man, I don't know how Jesus didn't come back in the middle of that sucker. It was so good. And then there are other days that I preach and I walk back there in my office and I do just like this. Lord, if there is anybody else on the planet you think would do this, please send them here so I can get out of the way. And it never fails. When I have those moments and I walk out there to shake hands and see somebody, Somebody will come up and go, I don't know how you knew, but today I rededicated everything in my life to Jesus Christ. And I go, whoa, 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 wait, no, no, no. Um, was there a worship song that was really good? Because that sermon was horrible. I don't say that, but that's what I feel. See, I, I, I got to set me aside. I, I've got to deny myself and then I've got to begin carrying the weight of the cross. Now I'm supposed to just breeze through. Nowhere, nowhere, please hear me if you hear nothing else today. Nowhere in that Bible that you have, whether it's in your lap, in your car, on your phone, or on your coffee table at home. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that there will not be weight that the Christian has to carry. In fact, he even ramps it up in another place in the... Matthew when he's talking with the disciples chapter 10 this is what he says and whoever does not take his cross and follow me sounds heavy doesn't it I don't know if Jesus would say something like that Vince except he did and again, we get to this place and we have this image in our mind of all the really nice Jesus, God is love comments that we hear. And we have all this stuff over here that's like we're supposed to just shred the world when they do one thing wrong. And where do we land in the middle? We take up our cross. We deny ourselves. We follow Jesus. Because here's the reality of the end of it all. When the day comes and the trumpet blows and God takes us home or we die and leave this, we will stand before God and you will get one of two phrases to you. One of two, there's not going to be this radically long conversation because everything that you've done will come out before God. He knows. How you've lived, what you've sacrificed, what it is you've submitted to Christ, and what you haven't, He knows. And so when we stand before God, enter in, my good and faithful servant, to thy rest. Well, that's going to be a day. See, when he says that, I get to go in and I get to go see my mom. I get to go see my uncles. I get to go see some friends of mine who have gone on before. And the Hebrews, it talks about so great a cloud of witnesses. I get to go see them in heaven. And, woo, that's going to be church. I can't wait. The other phrase is the most heartbreaking phrase in all of Scripture. I repeat that. I say that often. You, if you're here in your regular real life, you hear me say this a lot. It is by far the most heartbreaking, saddest phrase in all of Scripture. You worker of iniquity. If you want the regular English version of that. You who continued in sin. 
I have never known you. Depart. Go away. When I was about, I think I was about six years old, we were in a car wreck. My dad was driving and we were getting ready to turn off the road and somebody came around to pass because we were turning too slow and ended up T-boning our car. Hit my dad right in the driver's side door. This was back before seat belts, so the lack of seat belt saved me because I bounced around that big old Lincoln back seat. We went to the hospital. And it was a few days later they finally let me see dad. He had amnesia. Like, it messed him up pretty good, so he couldn't remember anything. And I remember going to the door and the nurse walking me to the door. And she was like, come here, son. So I walked over right next to her and I stood in the door and I was so excited because I hadn't seen my dad in a couple days and they told me he was okay. And so I got to the door to see my dad. And my dad was laying across the room in the hospital bed and there was a nurse there working with him. And he, leaned, he looked at me and I looked at him and I smiled and he smiled. And he tugged on the nurse and told her to come closer. And I could hear him. He said, ma'am, I feel like I should know who that boy is, but I don't know him. As bad as it was to hear my dad say that to me as a six-year-old boy, what it does to my heart what it does in my soul to know that there will be some of you because you're not willing to set your stuff aside. You're not willing to deny yourself. You will stand before the one who created you. And although he's given you every opportunity to know him, you've said, I'm going to do it my way. And so the phrase you will hear is depart. You stayed with sin rather than choosing me. And I don't know you. <laughs>